years in millions of homes. A man loved a woman, a child it was born. It learned how to hurt and it learned how to cry like humans do. Hi, welcome to the Tommy Rocket Show. We're in the 197th episode this evening. We're here with highly esteemed guest, Dr. Barbara Roberts, and of course, Peter Phipps, the plenty potentiary to the Tommy Rocket Show with a hot, hot topic. Everybody knows the hottest topic today is Barbara's new book. Tell us, Peter, what is the book we're talking about today? Well, Barbara can talk about the book. Yes, and, and by will. the way, and welcome to will. the Tommy Rock Show. Thank you for coming on. Thank so, you for having me, Tommy and yes, Peter. Yes, Peter, tell us what we're thinking here. Well, I, we should just one thing. Barbara, this is what, your third book, right? Actually, it's my fourth and that so I've had published. The yes. others are? My first published book was called How to Keep from Breaking Your Heart, What Every Woman Needs to Know About Cardiovascular Disease. Right. And my second book was called Treating and Beating Heart Disease, A Consumer's Guide to Cardiac Medicines. My third book was called The Truth About Statins, Risks and Alternatives to Cholesterol-Lowering Drugs. And my latest book is called The Doctor Broad, A That's Mafia great. Love Story. A Mafia Love Story. Now, yeah. we were, that was the whole point here, Get run through your, uh, your list. But uh, so if you watch Crime Town, if you watch the Tommy Rocket Show when we had Barbara on before. Yes, or, about episode when, 11. When we had the cat and mouse group on, on Crime Town, you know Barbara. Yeah, of course. Everybody, she's famous uh, in Rhode Island. And so the question obviously comes to you, and well, how do we understand Barbara? And Crime Town didn't talk a lot about your childhood or your young adulthood or your activism, actually. Correct. So uh, tell us a little bit about your family. I, there's some great lines in here, and if you don't get to them, I'll prompt you. But t tell me about your family. Well, I was raised as the oldest of 10 children in a devout Catholic family. Oh. And we lived in what was sort of a left-wing Catholic commune. My parents were followers of Dorothy Day, who was a co-founder of something called the Catholic Workers' Movement. And we were really raised to be saints, preferably yes. martyrs. Right. My father's favorite expression was, rally round your priests blindly. And there was really? a plaque on the wall of our dining room that read, Christ is the head of this house, the unseen host at every meal, the silent listener to every conversation. Oh, oh my God, I so, would have been afraid. So that just adds to the intrigue of this story. Uh, you have an esteemed professional career you read through the titles, and you come from this strictly devout uh, family. And yet, as you read through the book, you'll see sort of this idea of, uh, there's one part of the book where you say something about uh, you were trained uh, to treat, and, and it kind of comes together with your medical training, every down and out person you treated like the Christ or something. So, right. So, so, right. so medicine now comes into this. Yes. Into your... I mean, people ask me, why did you become a doctor? And I always say, because I couldn't become a priest. Right. My father worshiped priests and doctors. And in those days, nobody had even heard of women priests. So I knew I didn't have a <laughs> prayer of becoming a priest. So I decided to become a doctor at a time when there was a tremendous amount of discrimination against uh, accepting women into medical school. 99% of medical schools had a quota, and no class was more than 10% women. Right. There's a line in there where, as a young girl, you said, what did I want to be? I wanted to be a man. Right. And then you go on to say, I couldn't even be an altar boy. Right. I mean, who wouldn't want to be a man versus a woman or a boy versus a girl? Because... They got to do more. You got to do more. You had uh, fewer restrictions. Many more professions were open to you. It just seemed like... A no-brainer. Now, how does the family order play into this? Being the oldest, you must have gotten response. If you're a child, I can't imagine having twins, how you would manage it. I can't imagine having 10 children. But I think you intimate that the oldest child took on yes. supervisory responsibility. Yes, my right? mother had 10 children in three years, and I was the eldest. So that by the time I was eight years old, when my mother went to the hospital to have a baby, because she did every year, I would be taken out of school, and I would stay home, and I would take care of all my siblings. My. A few of them you know, were in school. The rest, I cooked and cleaned, changed diapers, ironed their clothes, did the laundry. You must have been cooking early. Oh, I was, yes. 
very early. So, so the other thing about that I love in the book, uh, which is out, which is published, um, is how smart you were as a kid. So, and I, I, you brought what you told one anecdote. Uh, the language in, the, in your book is, the vocabulary is very sophisticated, but the story you told about homonyms, now just to remind people, like break, hom- break and break is a homonym. Two words sound the same, and they spell differently, mean different things. Pen is a homonym. You, as a third, year, third grader, the teacher asked, what children do you know about homonyms? And you said? Well, she was asking for examples of right, homonyms. Example. Yep. I was in the third grade, and I said, world and world. And the next day, I was in the fourth grade. Right. So W O R L D and W H I R L E D. Correct. And when I read that, first time I read it, world, and I had to say again, world, oh yeah. And then you went to the fourth grade. Yes. Right. And, uh, and I was small to begin with, so I was always the shortest in my class. Right. Now, what was, about gender growing up? And, and what about your ideas about sexuality? The, it's a sexy book, I have to tell readers out there. <laughs> Uh, That's why it's so hot. (laughs) It's hot not only because there's a secret mob romance and there's Raymond Patriarch and there's the whole aura of Crime Town, but it's also a pretty sexy book. Uh, But what did you growing up? Wasn't it a strict? uh, Oh, you got to be a nun, right, or something? Yes, I you know I knew that I didn't want to grow up and get married and have ten children. So I thought the only alternative was to be a nun. And, and you know, we were, we were raised in total ignorance of sexual matters. I asked my parent, uh, I asked my mother, you know, where do babies come from? And she said, well, if you're a good Catholic and you love God, then he blesses you with children. And I thought to myself, boy, my parents must be great Catholics what because is, they have a baby every year. Right, again and, and again. That's hardly an explanation. It makes you think, what does that mean? All we knew is that that part of our body Nobody could go near, including yourself. It would be a mortal sin. Right. Uh, And if you died with a mortal sin unforgiven, you went to hell for all eternity. And burn. Yes. Right. And this is the family that... Now, how are you encouraged to be a martyr? I don't understand that, frankly. Well, if you died for your faith, then no matter how many sins you committed, you went immediately to heaven and, you know, frolicked with God for all eternity. Uh Ah, yes. Now... God. uh, (laughs) But instead, you became, as a young woman, a feminist and an activist, and you were in the face of the establishment and authority. Yes. So, so how did you go from what was the breaking obedient point? Catholic girl in a very religious family to rabble riser of of the premier sort? You were there in Vietnam. You were there with you know Gloria Steinem, and you talk about. So how did that happen? I left the church over their stance on birth control because I got married very young. I was two weeks past my 20th birthday, and I married my college sweetheart, who was a star quarterback at Columbia by the name of Archie Roberts. A golden boy. Golden boy. And um, I was on the pill, and then I developed problems with the pill and had to go off the pill, and he would not allow, allow me to use any other form of birth control. And I got pregnant as a freshman in medical school. And I realized that I was gonna use birth control no matter what after Mm. she was born, after my child was born, which I did. And then as the women's movement dawned when I was a a resident at Yale, I started reading books by Kate Millett, by Shulamith Firestone, sexual politics, I read Wilhelm Reich, and I realized that controlling a woman's reproductive life was of paramount importance to her being able to develop fully as a human being. And I broke with the church, and I realized that um, every woman should have the right to choose whether or when she became pregnant. And if she became pregnant against her will, she should have the right to terminate that pregnancy. So I became active in the pro-choice movement even before Roe v. Wade legalized abortion in 1973. I co-founded something called the Women's National Abortion Action Coalition while I was a resident at Yale with some uh, female Yale law students and other people. Mm. And we actually organized the first mass uh, pro-choice demonstration on um, November 20th in 
1971 in Washington, D.C. Now, wow. we're, we're going to, interestingly, in, early in the book, uh, you say, uh, why did you, you know, sort of the question come up, why, why, what's this book about and who am I? And you say, my commitment to feminism and medicine has led me into unexpected byways. I have traveled a path I never foresaw into moral dilemmas I never envisioned. Uh, we're going to get to those uh, moral dilemmas you never envisioned. We're going to have a, three readings. We have a book. We should do readings. Mm -hmm. uh, the, two of them are, are pretty well uh, covered by Crime Town, but not by you personally. And that is your first, your, we'll get to your first, uh, your, your, how you came to be Raymond Patriarcha, head of the mafia in New England, how you became his, his physician and what that entailed. We'll then get to your, your secret love affair with Louis Minocchio. And then finally, we'll get to the night you had to rescue your daughter and ended up getting arrested. And, 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 and these are things, the, the final one is not much in Crime Town. But um, if you could, I think, we'll have the readings, the Raymond Patriarcha stuff at the end. But uh, do you want to just read the beginning before the break of the Raymond Patriarcha? Setting it up this way, um, you had a friend named Vinny who talked about all his connections to the Mafia, whether they were actual or not, it's unclear. Mm -hmm. and, and through him, you learned of Jack Cicilline, the lawyer, Jack Cicilline. Well, no, well I, I first heard about Jack from him, but what? I became friendly with Jack through my friendship with the cardiac surgeon, Dr. Robert Indalia. Oh, that's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. We may have to begin the reading because we're coming extremely close to the end of the first segment of the Tommy Rocket Show. And we only have one minute left. Can you read it in a minute? No. How about just read the opening? Can you read the sure, opening? Sure, I'll read the opening. Oh, sure, sure. Picture this. It's the night of December 4th, 1980. The temperature during the day barely edges above freezing. Right now, the thermometer hovers around 15 degrees, a harbinger of the bitter cold that will grip the state for the next two months. The waning crescent moon has already set, and the darkness is palpable. I'm hurtling through the backwoods of northwest Rhode Island in a late model Ford driven by a young associate of my friend, the notorious mob lawyer, Jack Cicilline. Good. Wow. Well, it's good. So, I mean, it's already compelling. More. We'll have more. More. After the break, right? After the break. So stay tuned to the second segment of the Tommy Rocket Show. You'll be glad you did. Behind the beauty lies the beast. information, call the right people for the ethical treatment of animals, P.O. Box 42516, Washington, D.C., 20015. Hi, and welcome back to the second segment of the Tommy Rocket Show with Dr. Barbara Roberts and Peter Phipps. We were getting into the first reading. Barbara, why don't you continue with the reading and uh, thrill us, because I know it's hot. Go ahead. We're on our way to check on his even more notorious client, Raymond Ellis Patriarca, the longtime head of the New England Mafia. We raced by crumbling dry stone walls, stone ender homes built in the style of the 17th century, and deer munching on frozen grass. Raymond had been arrested at his home in Johnston, Rhode Island, while eating dinner that evening. A diabetic for many years, he was too distraught to finish the meal, despite having already taken his insulin. His son, Raymond Jr. Patriarcha, and his wife, Rita O'Toole Patriarcha, are afraid he'll react badly to the excess insulin or that he'll have an angina attack. He's also ne neglected to take his nitroglycerin with him. He's being taken to the Rhode Island State Police Barracks in Situate. Settled in 1710 by families from Massachusetts, the town's name was derived from an Indian word meaning, meaning cold river. I'm 36 years old, but look younger. I have dark brown hair reaching my shoulders, dark brown eyes, and a sprinkling of freckles across my nose and che cheeks. I am slim, five feet, four inches tall, and I weigh in at a whopping 107 pounds. I'm the first female adult cardiologist to practice in Rhode Island, having arrived here in 1977, three years earlier. Prior to Raymond's arrest, I had agreed to consult on the ailing crime boss's health at the request of his son, 
but I had not yet met the man who was to be my patient in person. Now his need for medical attention has become urgent. The charges he is facing, based on an informant's testimony, include accessory and conspiracy to murder. These are just the latest in a string of legal entanglements Raymond has dealt with since he was a teenager. They will not be the last. So, and thus begins uh, a very unique and interesting doctor-patient relationship. Uh, it infuriated the state police and probably Colonel Stone to no end. And, and what was their problem with Raymond Patriarchy being treated by a physician and having the physician stand up for his uh, perilous health condition? What, what, was, what was going on with the state police? Well, the state police had wanted for many years to put Raymond away for good, is what I've been told. I don't know that, you know, from their mouths. I um, think that's correct. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought I would just go there and, you know, check on Raymond and reassure his son and his wife that he was okay. And you when, were ho sort of hoping that would be the way this would play out, right? Well, I, I just... I hadn't seen him yet as a patient right. because although he had been scheduled to come to my office for his first office visit, in the meantime, he had developed a gangrenous toe and he was admitted to St. Joseph's Hospital, or Fatima Hospital rather, for an amputation. Mm. So I had told his son, no problem. After he's discharged, I'll reschedule his office visit. And it was only a few days after his discharge that he was arrested. Now. You know, like most people in the U.S. in those days, my image of a mafia don was Marlon Brando from The Godfather. Mm. And what I saw that night was something very different. Mm -hmm. I was brought into a room, and I introduced myself. And I took one look at him, and I thought, oh, my God, he's tiny. And my second thought was, holy blank. He looks like he's going to have a cardiac arrest any minute, and I'll never be able to resuscitate him. And was he pale? And, and how, yeah, how did you know? He was cyanotic. Which, it, which means? He was blue. Uh -huh. He was blue. No blood to his extremities. He, That's cyanotic? He, well, his, his mouth was blue. His skin was dusky. He was sweating. He was short of breath. He was obviously having difficulty breathing. And um, I asked him if I could listen to his heart and lungs, and I did. And his pulse was highly erratic, which can be a harbinger of sudden cardiac death in someone with known heart disease. And I knew he had heart disease because he had had a heart attack in the 1960s. And here it is, you know, a good 15 years later or so. And I said to him, are you having angina? And he said, yes. And, and excuse me a second. Angina is angina lack of is the blood, symptom what? is the symptom people get when their heart is starved for oxygen. Right. Okay. Like okay. tightness in your chest. It's usually experiences a tightness or a pressure or a burning in the chest. Angina is a Latin word meaning strangling or oh. choking because the first physician who described it wrote about it in Latin. Oh. So angina pectoris means a strangling or a choking in the chest. Right. Oh. And. Um, he, he said, I forgot my nitroglycerin. So Major Benjamin, who was second in command of the state police, piped up, Doc, he can use mine if you'd like. And I said, mm, probably not a good idea because I don't know if it's the same dose. But someone was sent to his house to bring his uh, nitroglycerin. And I gave him nitroglycerin. And I, had to, I think I gave him several uh, before we got any effect on the angina. And by that time, it had lasted for a few hours. And it's very common. Mm -hmm with someone with severe heart disease, which I knew he had because he'd been diabetic for almost 40 years and had a history of a prior heart attack, it's very common um, with you know, a prolonged angina attack like that, that that can be a harbinger that they're about to have a heart attack. And you felt that And I felt that he was imminently going to have a heart attack. So I said, this man has to be admitted to the hospital which I never thought was going to be the outcome, but it clearly was indicated. I mean, anybody who looked at him would know, any physician who looked at him would know that he was in dire straits. Was this because he had gone so long in that condition without nitroglycerin? Yes, and because the nitroglycerin wasn't totally effective in relieving his discomfort. And he was still having a very erratic pulse. Yeah. Now, you can fake the symptom of angina 
but if you hook someone up to an EKG, there are clear cut and diagnostic changes in the EKG when someone's heart is starved for oxygen. And when we got to the hospital, that in fact was what Raymond's EKG showed. But I had to call Colonel Stone and he was very reluctant to let me do this. He said, you're gonna have to speak to the state police surgeon. So I called the state police surgeon, I introduced myself, I gave him the history, I gave him my physical findings. This, this is a, all at Raymond's house? At this, no, no, this is oh, only Situate State Police, police right. Barracks, okay, right. Situate, yeah. you know, where, where I'd never been That's before. Right. Okay, yeah. well, sorry. And he said, oh, you're absolutely right, Dr. Roberts, he's gotta to go to the hospital. <laughs> so I called Colonel Stone back and Colonel Stone said, well, all right, but I want him admitted to Fatima, because that's the only place where we can keep him under 24-hour guard. And I had this brainstorm. I suddenly remembered, and I said to Colonel Stone, that's not true, Colonel Stone. Remember Anthony Stamini? Anthony Stamini, who was out on bail, was found shot, rolled up in a rug, and put in the trunk of a car. <laughs> and he was taken to the Miriam Hospital, where he was kept under 24-hour guard. Mm. And of course, Colonel Stone couldn't deny that because knew it was that. true, he knew it. <laughs> and so I was allowed to take Raymond to the Miriam Hospital where he was admitted and he wound up actually staying for six weeks. Really? Now, this is the first in the book and in Crime Town, the first of several very dramatic chapters where it's, it's the state police, Raymond, and you, and whether he goes to trial or goes to court or, you felt, felt was another life or death situation. The, the, the next one is, is they wanted to take a deposition at his house? Was that, was that the next instance? No, I think the next one was when he was, uh, a couple of days or weeks later, I don't remember offhand, he was also indicted in a, in a second murder conspiracy charge by um, the state of Massachusetts. And they wanted him to appear in court and he was in the hospital. So Jack couldn't get them to wait. They wanted to depose him. And so I asked a nurse friend of mine to come with me and we you know, packaged up some drugs that we might need. And we went in, uh, in the ambulance with him from the Merriam Hospital to the New Bedford courtroom. Mm, right, right. I said, was... I, I said to Beth, I said, you would think he was a till of the hun in his prime mm. rather than an elderly man who can't walk across the room without getting angina. Right, now, now part of this, uh, uh, but you now, let me just interject a little, you develop a very close personal relationship with Raymond. He considers you like his daughter. Yes. Uh, did that catch you by surprise or how did, when you realized that he cared for you personally and deeply as a, as a young woman who could be, as he said, I would love like my daughter. How did that affect you? You know, as I talk about in the book, I had been subjected to political persecution myself. At one point, as my first marriage dissolved, I almost lost custody of my children because of my political beliefs. And I had had informants, you know, tell lies to the FBI about me long before I ever met Raymond. I used to tease Raymond, I'm probably the only one of your doctors who has an FBI file as thick as your own. <laughs> so I did not by any means think that the judicial system was infallible. And if his, you know, charges were simply because of an informant, I was not going to automatically believe in his guilt, but his guilt or innocence was beside the point. My job as a physician right. was to put his interests ahead of my own. And after observing him in the hospital, of those first six weeks I took care of him, I realized that the least little bit of stress caused him to have severe angina. A little bit of stress. So you can imagine what the stress of going to trial and right. prison would be. Right. I thought it was tantamount to a death sentence. And you prevailed in every instance when, you're, when your advice and your counsel was called upon. So if the story ended there... Uh, well, she you, had to get tough. Right, but it'd be a people. much simpler story if the story ended there. An older man, he's clearly very sick, you're a doctor, you feel committed to help him, and you do. He's Raymond Petrarca. But then came your love affair with Louis Menacchio. Yeah. Which we'll talk about because we've got seconds left, so we can't see. This will keep them going. Stay tuned 
for the third segment of the Tommy Rocket Show. And we'll be back more with Barbara Roberts and Peter Phipps. Hi, I'm Pamela Anderson Lee with PETA. You might not think about it every time you get dressed, but every time you put on a pair of shoes, a belt, or a pair of gloves, chances are you're wearing leather. And out of all the things that animals are abused for, leather is the most common. To learn how you can help, call PETA. Thank you. Hi, and welcome back to the third segment of the Tommy Rocket Show. As you know, we're here with Dr. Barbara Roberts and Peter Phipps. The topic we're getting into now is Louis well, Minocchio, right? right? So I think we have to set it up a little bit before we get to the reading. Okay. We've chosen sort of a dramatic moment that illustrates the fact that Barbara was living two lives and dangerous not only to herself and her professional life, mm -hmm. but also dangerous to Raymond. And uh, so just to recap a bit, uh, obviously if you're a, a physician operating in the, uh, the, the straight world, let's say, of the Rhode Island medical establishment, mm -hmm. um, there was some pressure about just being Raymond's doctor, but you also, as things happened in your life, you became uh, the friend and then the lover of the number two man, maybe, or three, uh, Louis Minocchio. And it was essential that that be kept secret. And for Raymond, because it would compromise all your testimony. Correct. So, so before you uh, get to the reading, which uh, shows how dicey this sort of was, like who knew, uh, uh, how much was it on your mind? Um, how hard was it to have this relationship that no one could know about? It was difficult. Uh, we met uh, at a luncheon. Um, Jack Cicilline invited me out to lunch at a restaurant on Federal Hill called The Forum. And Lewis was the manager at that time. Now, Lewis had returned to Rhode Island a couple of years before that because he had fled the jurisdiction, convinced that he couldn't get a fair trial. He was one of the people who was uh, indicted for accessory and conspiracy of a double murder, uh, Marf Marfio and Maley murder, in I think it was 1968. And the only witness against everyone who was indicted was an informant by the name of Red Kelly. And over the years, Red Kelly had developed Alzheimer's. So Lewis's lawyers, after he'd been abroad for you know, close to 10 years, negotiated a deal where he would come back to Rhode Island and he would be free on bail pending a trial. But his lawyers were convinced there would never be a trial because the only witness was uh, suffering from dementia. Mm -hmm. However, the, his lawyers were wrong. And the s state uh, scheduled a trial. And as part of their case, they wanted to depose Raymond about his relationship with Lewis. So I would likely have to testify in court yet again how testifying in a criminal case was very dangerous for Raymond and would likely precipitate severe angina. And possible death. And possible so death. So you were in the courthouse. I was in the courthouse during Lewis's trial because Jack thought I might have to testify. So this is the reading about that. In Raymond's trial. No, this was Lewis's Lewis, trial. Lewis's trial. Lewis's That's trial. why you were in the courthouse. Okay. Yes. Okay. On the second day of testimony, Jack asked me to come to court in case Judge Kiley wanted my sworn testimony about Raymond's condition. The day's session had not yet begun while the lawyers and judge conferred in chambers. I stood outside the courtroom pacing back and forth while I waited to find out whether my testimony would be required. Suddenly, Lewis rounded the corner of the hallway. Seeing me, he stopped as abruptly as if he'd slammed into an invisible wall. Our eyes met for an instant, and then he whirled around and rushed off in the opposite direction. I realized that anyone watching this scene would have known the truth of our relationship in a moment. In the event, I was not called to testify in court that day or on any other day of Lewis's trial, but the judge did grant the prosecution's motion to compel Raymond to give a deposition. Hmm. 
Now the deposition is a completely another dramatic section of the book, but yes. do we go on here at this point? Sure. Or yes? Go ahead. At times the hardest part was trying to lead what passed for a normal life with the children. On the last weekend in May, Megan was the flower girl at a wedding of one of the cardiac catheterization lab technicians. The ceremony was held at a spare, typically New England church in Barrington, Rhode Island, located on a salt pond that was home to flocks of swans and egrets. Its pristine white steeple rose into a sky whose limpid blue is found only near the sea. As I moved through the day, reaping praise for my daughter's beauty and poise, I longed to have Lewis at my side, but that, of course, was impossible. I realized not for the first time how much I resented the secrecy our situa situation required. My life ran on two parallel but very separate tracks. I inhabited two very different worlds. In one, I was a single mother and busy physician, a teacher, a mentor, a stalwart of the local Planned Parenthood, an attendee at my children's theater and sports performances, and a sailboat racer. In that world, I was a respected physician, if somewhat controversial. In my other world, I was a secret lover of an alleged organized crime figure, and the physician whose testimony was preventing the head of the New England Mafia from having to go to trial, and almost certainly to prison. In that world, I was looked up to and admired for my defense of Raymond. I was a Federal Hill folk heroine. The straight world was where I spent most of my time. It was a world whose rules I knew without having to be told. The Federal Hill world was one of secrets, of mobsters and FBI agents, a world carrying with it the possibility of sudden violence, of arrests, of prison terms, a world whose rules I groped to understand. In one life, I socialized with some of the most prominent respected Rhode Islanders, and, the other, and in the other, I slept with and loved one of its mo most notorious criminal figures. I was considered a heroine by people whose presence in the same room with straight citizens would have frightened and scandalized them. In effect, I was suspended over the abyss, separating these two tracks, in danger at any moment of losing my footing and being annihilated. Mm -hmm. So wow! So uh, that's very well written. How, Thank you. how did you um, sleep during yeah, this period? I, I, yeah. <laughs> well, I've never slept well in oh. my whole life. Well, there you are. Was, yes, it was. It was very stressful and, in many ways, very traumatic. I mean, there there were so many traumatic events during the close to four years I took care of Raymond which I go into in the book. Right, but the Louis thing was another level, I think, and, and uh, everybody knew you were Raymond's physician. Your nemesis, the Providence Journal, wrote about it continually. Uh, who, knew, who knew that you, of your secret? Love? Only my closest friends and family. How Jack Cicilline's wife realized one day when she saw, what, she and I were having lunch at the forum and she saw Louis eat some food off my plate. Knowing yeah. you, knowing uh, him, yes, know it. that yes. was it. You that were intimate, it. so to yes. speak. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the FBI, you think, knew at one time. I know they did because one of the traumatic events that happened during this period of time when I was Raymond's doctor was that I underwent a very long custody trial in yeah, family we'll, we'll court. We'll get into that, right, and, in a sense. Uh, and one day my lawyer, whose name was Al Lepore, um, I came to the office for the pre-hearing, you know, the pre-trial conference of the day, and he said, Doc, he had this raspy voice, we got a problem. I thought, oh no, what now? And he, and he told me that he had heard about a, an FBI surveillance form who put me with Lewis. He says, is this true? Mm. I said, yes, it is. He said, you know, something like, Jesus, Doc, don't you know how terrible that would be if that was sprung on me in court and I didn't know about it? Mm. And I said, Louis, I, 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 I mean, I said, Albert, I really thought you knew. You know, Marty Leppo is Louis's lawyer and Marty Leppo's law, your lawyer. So yeah. I just assumed you knew. He yeah. said, Doc, you think we sit around like a bunch of broads talking about who's doing who, who's <laughs> seeing who? Back to Dr. Broad. We don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you, when you, when you were lovers with Lewis, how did you go out in public together? We didn't. You couldn't? Uh, except in New York. Uh -huh. In Rhode Island, I would often eat at the Forum, usually with my children yes. or other friends. It was a great restaurant. 
It was, but we, you know, we never went and to the movies. And he was there. And he was there. He was the manager. So, of course, he would come over and sit at my table. Right, right. So you couldn't go out in public and have public affection or anything? Not in Rhode Island. You know, it's yeah. funny. I would have thought that the FBI would have told the colonel. And then the colonel would have told the journal. Yeah. Uh, uh, to this day, it's a mystery to me. Maybe but I'm very thankful to. that it <laughs> didn't right. get in the newspaper. And how many people came up to you or whatever and learned of your relationship with Lewis on Crime Town? Oh, I think there were many, many, because, you know. Nobody, but basically nobody knew. Nobody except knew. My and Mark Smerling, the producer of Jamestown, the first time he met with me, after letting me hear the first episode, because I hadn't made up my mind whether I was going to participate, I said, so Mark, what do you think you know about me? And he said, <laughs> Well, I know you were Raymond Patriarch's physician. I Which said, is all and, he was probably interested yes, in, right? And I said, yes, and while, he, while I was his physician, I was Louis Menacchio's mistress. And his eyes almost <laughs> bugged out of his head, and his jaw dropped. He had no idea. And then he had to control himself, because the next question was, will you talk about that? Well, it wasn't the next question, but... <laughs> it, it, believe it, me, it, in his it, mind, yes, it was he, queued up as he next. He did eventually... Um, Ask me that. that all that together between Lewis and Raymond, they didn't even have stuff like that on The Sopranos. <laughs> no. <laughs> they didn't. I mean, no, but you know. but and I should point out, it's a touching moment in the book where Raymond knows obviously they're yes. having a relation. And yes. what did Raymond say to you? He said, you know, something like, "Don't worry about Lewis. He's a good man. He'll be okay." He said, "I would rather go to prison myself than than to do anything to help them put him there." Wow. Okay. So we're going to come back with the time you did get arrested. Oh, boy. Yes. So, uh, and that's a, a reading and so on and so forth. So stay tuned. Stay tuned and come back for the fourth and final segment of the Tommy Rocket Show with Barbara Roberts and Peter Phipps. And we'll see you soon. Hi, I'm Alicia Silverstone with PETA. When it comes to animals, there's no need to be a classroom cut up. Use your right to refuse to dissect frogs, cats, pigs, even worms. Contact me at PETA for information on exciting, humane alternatives to dissection. They'll help you make the grade without using animals. Remember, biology is the study of life, not death. Thanks. Hi, and welcome back to the fourth and final segment of the Tommy Rocket Show. You know we're here with Peter Phipps and Dr. Barbara Roberts. So what were we talking about in the last well, segment? We were, we, were we were reading from reading. The Doctor Broad. Yes, the and, book. And our setup was something you had alluded to earlier in the show, and that is that you had a long-running, nasty custody case. And, uh, and it, it was the father of your daughter, Megan, uh, uh, and he, Ned, right? Yes. Uh, he was an interesting character uh, in the fact that he was basically your house husband or it was a, there was a role reversal going on. I said it was a non-marriage of convenience with sex role reversal. Right. And because we never married. There's an early reference early in the book where you're in medical school and, or you're um, in your residency and the distinguished Dr. Lown is chastising you for being late. And Dr. Lowndes says to you, uh, Barbara, if you were a man, we wouldn't put up with this. And you said, If I were a man, I'd have a wife looking after my children. That's a great answer. Now, Ned sort of played that role in a sense. He was gay uh, and said you were the most macho person he ever met or something right. like that. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of gender stuff in the book, people. Uh, but it didn't go well. Um, he had custody, weekend custody. Visitation. Right. V visitation, right, right. The custody was a man. And Megan called you, frantic. She's what, four years old or something? Yes. And she's, and you became, it was a scary, scary night for you. Yes, but, it was. So pick it up there from the doctor okay. brought. On Saturday night, Megan called, and I could tell from her voice that something was bothering her. She told me that her father said she wasn't coming home to me the next day. I assured her that she would be coming home the next night, just as she always did on weekends she spent with her father. Megan seemed to possess wisdom far beyond her years, as if she were indeed inhabited by an old soul that had survived many lifetimes. 
I adored her, as did her older siblings, and was determined to protect her as much as possible from the ugliness of the court battle. I lived in constant fear that Ned would kidnap her again, as he had once done when she was an infant. At that time, he flew both of them to San Francisco and only returned after I paid him the expenses for the trip. From personal experience, I knew that he often drank to excess and used drugs. In fact, he smoked marijuana in Megan's presence, something I never did. My style of parenting was to lead by example. I believed that actions spoke louder than words. I seldom drank alcohol, and I never smoked marijuana in the children's presence. Now that I was Raymond's physician, I never smoked marijuana at all, unsure when I might be followed by undercover police or FBI agents. So I worried constantly when she was with her father during his court-ordered visitation, and I'm sure she sensed this, despite my efforts to hide my unease. That Sunday morning, the shrill note of the telephone awakened us at 7.30. Even before I picked up the phone, I was seized with dread and a premonition of danger. Megan's hysterical voice screamed, Mommy, come get me! Mommy, come get me! Before the telephone was slammed down. I was instantly awake and frantic. I called her back, but the line was busy. George, my then boyfriend, tried to calm me down as we both hurriedly dressed. The phone rang again within minutes with Megan's terrified voice repeating the same plea. Various scenarios played obsessively across the screen of my mind. Had her father taken an overdose? Had he brought someone home who was attacking them both? Whatever was going on, I needed to get her away from it and back to our home where I could protect her. On the way out of the house, George grabbed a baseball bat, not knowing what we would find at Ned's apartment. We got into the car and drove the short distance to Ned's address. On the street, all was quiet. There was no sound emanating from the house, which only increased my terror. Were we too late? Were they already dead or gone? The back door to the building was locked, and no one responded to our knocks. We forced the door open and crept up the stairs. After Megan's phone calls, the silence was eerie and chilling. On the second floor landing was a suitcase I recognized as Ned's. I turned the knob of the door handle and was able to open the door a few inches before it was caught and held by a flimsy hook and eye latch like the ones used to secure screen doors. I was able to see into the tiny room. Ned cowered on the floor in the corner, hissing like a cornered cat. The police are on their way, was all he said. A mattress took up most of the floor space, and on it I could see the outline of a little crouched body, covered with soiled blankets. I was terrified that Megan was dead and screamed her name. Putting our shoulders to the door, George and I burst open the lock and entered the room. With this, Megan jumped up from the bed and held her arms out to me in mute appeal. I scooped her into my arms, and we ran down the stairs, Ned in pursuit. Megan kept pleading, take me home, Mommy, take me home. Ned followed us across the street to where the car was parked, but when we got there, George took the baseball bat from the back seat and started to advance towards him. At this, Ned turned and fled while I screamed at George to leave him alone and get back in the car. Ned was never touched, but I knew what would happen next. Right, and what happened next was you were charged with a breaking and entry felony, correct? Yes, uh, that Monday I was in family court trying to get uh, a suspension of Ned's visitation and I got a call from Jack Cicilline's secretary saying, Barbara, wherever you are, go hide. There's a warrant out for your arrest. And I oh, said, yeah. I'm not that hard to find, I'm in family court. I told uh, John Bevilacqua, who was my lawyer at the time, and he called the police station and arranged for me to surrender after the morning court session. So in addition to some of the f snapshots from your past, you have a mugshot. I, I don't know how well it's displayed at your house, but I know it's displayed. <laughs> and yeah, it's so, on the Crime Town website, and it's in the book. Right. So how long do you, uh, I mean, so this went on for a while, right? It went on for... I think a few years. And how did how the was the custody it? thing? No, the, no, the, the uh, I had this felony charge hanging over oh. my head. And, how and, could they arrest a mother for taking their own child? 
well, I'm sure I wouldn't have been arrested if I weren't Raymond's physician because oh, Ned had been well. calling them and accusing me of all kinds of things for oh. years, but it wasn't until I was Raymond's physician that any of his complaints were acted upon. Right. Oh, so how did it see. how did it end up resolving itself? I mean, the, it, got, it's, well, it was nasty and it dragged it, out, right? Yes, yeah. uh, the custody battle was uh, decided in my favor. I mean, I won everything, and he was enjoined from coming anywhere near us. His visitation was suspended. He was enjoined from calling my parents, my place of work, the mm -hmm. Department of Children and their Families. He was ordered to pay five dollars a week uh, child support. Um, the judge ruled that we were never common law married and that I was fit to have custody of my daughter. But the felony charge, um, I kept refusing to go and, and plead in court because you can't plead in district court to a felony. You have to go to superior court. Right. And I kept refusing to go. And finally, Ned and his lawyer were, were calling the federal prosecutors, even though it wasn't a federal case, and claiming that it was only because I was Raymond's doctor that I hadn't been indicted or It was or a Rhode Island charged. corruption case then, yes. in his mind. So, yeah. uh, so finally I went and I uh, pleaded innocent. And then, you know, I, obviously I, there was no bail. I was released on personal recognizance again. Um, and finally, uh, there was an article in the paper that said the felony charge had been dropped because the prosecution couldn't find the only witness, Ned Bresnahan. Mm. Now, they knew very well where Ned was. And the, the Providence Journal, when they wrote it up, almost made it sound like he was probably at the bottom of the Seekonk River in concrete overboots. <laughs> but he was actually living in Providence yeah. and working for a prominent industrialist. Hmm. But they didn't want to take me to court. They knew they would look so foolish. So. It's a painful story, that part of this story. Sure. It is. And, and painful for all of your children, too. Yes, yeah. yes. So why didn't you just let it go? Why, what, what was it about this story in your life, basically in your 20s and your 30s, that you decided to tell? Well, number one, as I say very early on in the book, I was raised in one world but came of age in another. Mm -hmm. The world has changed radically. And I wanted, particularly younger women, to have an idea of what their mothers and grandmothers went through to win them the rights that they take for granted, but which are under tremendous attack in Today. this day and age. There is a huge right-wing backlash against feminism, about women being able to control their own lives. And so I wanted younger women to know what they're up against and what some of the tools they can use to fight this re retrograde uh, moment that we're living in. Mm -hmm. You know, I talk about the demonstrations I spoke at. I, I, I talked about the, the sit-ins and the teach-ins and all the things that we had to do to win our rights, and may have to do again, by the way. Um, and also, in some ways, this was such a traumatic time in my life that writing about it was very cathartic. Mm. When I, fir when I finished the first draft of the book, which was many years ago now, I burst into tears. Ah. Oh, sure. I, I would sobbed be and sobbed of, and sobbed. Of... Because in order to write the book, I had to dredge up all those memories. Yeah. And it, it was very painful. And do you have any regrets that you didn't leave it buried? No. Right. And uh, what about, so then the crime town part of it anyway, you became something of a celebrity Yes. You were on stage, and, and so you've told these stories you're telling today, and you're reading from your book uh, many times before. So how, how does that feel of when your life story becomes um, something that people will pay money to sit in a theater mm -hmm. to listen to or mm -hmm. to buy a book? What? Well, in some ways it feels good, but don't forget, I was written about constantly during, in the years when I was Raymond's physician. There was a big Sunday Magazine article mm -hmm. uh, called, uh, I think it was, the real Dr. Who is the Real Dr. Roberts? Mm -hmm. And that morning, that Sunday morning, I was making rounds in the hospital, and I overheard two of the nurses at the nurse's station talking. And one said to the other, have you read the article about Dr. Roberts in the paper today? And her friend said, nah, I'm going to wait for the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and and I realized well. at that point that, you know, this, this is a story that people find interesting. Well, that's for sure. I think it's interesting. Yeah. I think it's a hot, and it's a hot topic, you know, especially the Crime Town thing was really hot, and everybody loved it. 
So, know, so what is what is your expectation for the book? What what are you uh, well, I, I, what are you hoping and where where mm -hmm. do you how much? I guess it's a lot of work, right? Well, you know, doing the publicity in addition to the writing, mm -hmm. then you have to do the real work or whatever, you know. Yes. What mm -hmm. what what are you hoping for? Well, I think any author hopes that they've written a bestseller. Right, but bestseller. But the, the chances of that are vanishingly small. Mm -hmm. However, I have already gotten a lot of publicity. I mean, in the August issue of Rhode Island Monthly, there was an article about the book, and they excerpted uh, Chapter 9, which is the chapter that describes my meeting Lewis. And right. Salon.com, which is a very widely read right. online magazine, also um, excerpted the Dr. Broad and had nice things to say about it. Mm -hmm. And I have a book tour lined up, which will take me all over the country. Right. Uh -huh. So, uh, you know, part of the, the your, your, you identify yourself early on um, as a woman born in mid 20th century America who was raised in one world and came of age in another. And you talk about your feminism and your activism. So are you hoping this is a call to action for some women? I gathered that from what you were I saying earlier. I absolutely hope it's a call to action. Yes, I do, because I think we're at a very dangerous time in our history as a country and a very dangerous time for women. Mm -hmm. Well, the only thing I can say is that I want to thank you for all the effort you've put into producing this book. And I can tell, as Peter probably knows too, it's going to be a great success. And it's coming out, it's on Kindle soon. It's uh, on Kindle. Kindle. And um, in paperback and hardcover editions. And it'll be on Amazon and... At Barnes and Noble. Yes, I mean it's a great topic. It's a great topic, and uh, I want to thank you for your courage to write it, and you know seeing it through, and also for coming on the Tommy Rocket Show. You're was, very welcome, both of you. Was, thank you for having me. Oh, it was a pleasure as usual. And unfortunately, we're running out of time, so I want to thank once again Dr. Barbara Roberts, Peter Phipps, and our viewing audience in Rhode Island. Thank you for watching the Tommy Rocket Show. And we'll see you soon again. Thank you so much. So You hear people say it all the time. Someone else will do it. Someone else will donate blood. Because someone needs blood every two seconds. I'm happy to do it. It's just that it's a lot for one person to take on. Good night.